Hi, everybody. Thank you for joining us today. My name is Amy Schulenberg. I'm the clinical consultant for the Asia region for Pearson Clinical Assessment. Hope everybody's staying healthy and well during these crazy times that we're in. Uh, today's webinar is um, to introduce everybody to the new version of the Weschler Individual Achievement Test, the WIAT. Uh, we're up to the fourth edition, which is due to be released in the U.S. around September, which means we should get it in Asia uh, shortly thereafter. Um, the, the presenter for today is actually um, Gloria Macau. She is one of our clinical consultants in the U.S., and she is an expert on the Wyatt. And this webinar was pre-recorded, so um, she won't be able to answer questions live. However, I still encourage you to put questions in the Q&A panel, and I can ask her to respond to them over email, or some of them I may be able to respond to on her behalf. Um, so please do use the Q&A uh, the Q and A panel to ask questions. And also, my email address is there on the screen, and I encourage you to email me directly also if you have any questions. Um, if you're having technical trouble, just try refreshing your page and make sure the, uh, any other applications on your computer are closed. There's also a webinar troubleshooting guide that you can download from the resource list. So thank you very much for joining us, and now I will hand over to Gloria. Achievement Test, the fourth edition. And we hope that most of you are familiar with the third edition and will try to establish some comparisons between the Wyatt 3 and the soon to be published Wyatt 4. Before I get started with the content, we want to say a few words about the training materials you'll be receiving the handout later. And the information in the handout is protected by copyright. All of the training materials are protect protected by federal and international copyright laws. And we're granting you, as a qualified Wyatt 4 user, permission to use the materials for training only. So what do we hope to accomplish by the end of our time together today? I'm going to describe the changes from the Wyatt 3 to the Wyatt 4, and certainly we hope that you'll be able to do the same following the webinar. We hope that you'll be able to list the subtests and the composites that are new to the Wyatt 4, and that you'll be able to discuss how to use results from the Wyatt 4 to determine a student's eligibility and need for specialized services and also to identify goals for intervention. So I indicated that we're here to talk about the Wexler Individual Achievement Test, the fourth edition, the Wyatt 4, and that's certainly your plan, right? But ultimately, I think we all understand that the reason that we focus on a test like the Wyatt 4 is because of the individual students with whom we work. So we want to talk about how the Wyatt 4 can be used in service of the students in our classrooms and how the data from Wyatt 4 can help us understand what, what each student needs in order to succeed. So I was thinking about the students with whom, whom we work and how, if we think about it, each student has his or her own tree of knowledge. And when we're using a tool like the Wyatt 4, effectively what we're trying to understand is whether or not the student's um, store of knowledge will allow him or her to keep up with the demands in the classroom. So if I think about a third grader, for example, with whom I worked um, a lot when I worked as a, as a school psychologist, I think about this third grader who had a vocabulary that was outstanding when he was speaking with you, but who really struggled to learn to read. And we felt, myself and all of my colleagues, that we really didn't quite understand how to teach him to read, and we really struggled to understand. And so assessments like the Wyatt 4 might be able to help us to kind of um, unpack where the breakdown might be for him so that we could think about the, the services or the interventions that would be effective. And I think about maybe this um, high school senior who was getting ready to graduate from high school and getting ready to go to college and was really worried that he wasn't going to do well in college because in high school, the guidance counselor and his teachers always allowed him this extra time to complete 
um, classroom tests, um, anything that had to be completed in the classroom, he needed extra time. And he was really worried that without the, the goodwill of his teachers and the guidance counselor in the school, at high school, that he wouldn't succeed. And so we, maybe the Wyatt can help us to understand if he needs accommodation such as extended time and what accommodations he might need. So that's the purpose, really, when we think about the Wyatt for how can the results really help us to understand the, the students' needs and, therefore, what we can put in place in order to help them to succeed. So the Wyatt 4 is a comprehensive achievement test, just like the, the current edition, actually, which is the Wyatt 3. Um, it's going to be replaced here soon by the Wyatt 4. But they both are comprehensive achievement tests, and they measure oral language, specifically listening and speaking, as well as reading, writing, and math. The subtest or the, the comprehensive achievement measure is designed to be flexible. So you can use subtests to assess specific areas of need, or you can use subtests to assess a broad range of skills. And as I talk about the Wyatt 4, what I hope you'll see is that the Wyatt 4 will provide components that will allow you to screen. I'll talk about the dyslexia screening components, also components that will allow you to assess, to identify academic strengths and and needs, but also when we think about what to do based on the data, right? So you think about the interventions, and I'll talk about how you'll be able to generate um, goals and objectives, goal statements and objectives statements um, using some of the components of Wyatt 4. And then I'll also talk about the growth scale values and how we can use those to track the student's progress. So you think about this as a comprehensive achievement test that you can use starting with children in pre-kindergarten, age four, and going up through grade 12 and beyond, up through 50 years of age. We'll talk about the administration options. There's a paper option as well as a digital option in a combination of paper and digital, and we expect to publish in the fall of 2020. So before I talk about the, the makeup of the Wyatt 4, I just want to take a little brief segue um, going back to the beginning of the Wexler Individual Achievement Test that was in 1992. And when we published the Wyatt in 1992, it was designed to be used with, with students starting in kindergarten and going up through grade 12. It consisted of eight subtests, and the subtests were actually developed to allow us to identify um, the areas that were required at the time for a classification of specific learning disability. In 2001, we revised the Wyatt, published the Wyatt 2. That one consisted of nine subtests. And then in 2009, we published the Wyatt 3, which consists of 16 subtests. And the Wyatt 4, which we'll publish this year, will consist of 20 subtests. But the purposes and uses of the Wyatt 4 will be consistent with those of the Wyatt 3, the Wyatt 2, and the Wyatt. We want to be able, certainly, to identify academic strengths and weaknesses. Some students perform really well in math, not as well in reading, for example. The Wyatt 4 will allow us to identify those patterns. Certainly, the test results can be used um, as part of your decision-making process around eligibility, classification, diagnosis, and also for planning instruction, identifying accommodations, as well as monitoring progress and um, conducting research. The administration options, um, certainly there is a print option. Um, you'll have your paper materials, the print manual, stimulus book, record form, and response booklet. And if you use all of those print components for administration, you have two options for scoring. One would be to use the print manual um, and use the tables in the manual for scoring. But you also have the option of using QGlobal for scoring. In addition, down at the bottom, you have an integrated digital test administration scoring and reporting um, system with our Q Interactive platform. And for that, you would need two iPads connected by Bluetooth. 
And then in the middle, the Q Global option is a combined digital and print option where some of the components are available in digital format and some of the components are available in print. If you use that Q Global option for administration, you have your same two options for scoring as you do with the print option for administration using the tables in the manual or using Q Global for scoring. So let's look at what is new on Wyatt 4. I want to talk first about the, the subtests that are new, and those subtests that are new will link us to the composite scores that are new. So there are five new subtests. There are five new composite scores. I'm going to talk about the dyslexia index scores that are now included with the Wyatt 4. I'll also talk about the scoring of the essay composition that is automated. We'll show you a brief demo of how the automated scoring of the essay composition works. And then we'll talk about simplified scoring of the sentence composition subtest. So I mentioned that there are 16 subtests on Wyatt 3 and 20 on Wyatt 4. And I want to take a look at how those subtests break down when we look at the broad academic areas that are assessed. So when you look at language, for example, on Wyatt 3, we had the listening comprehension and the oral expression components, and those are on Wyatt 4 as well. In addition, we added two new subtests that assess language processing, phonemic proficiency and orthographic choice. And if you look over to the right where I have those listed, you'll see that next to orthographic choice, I have an asterisk indicating that that one is available on Q Interactive only. For reading, we always had subtests that assessed basic reading skills as well as reading comprehension and oral reading fluency. And you'll notice word reading and pseudo word decoding are on both Wyatt 3 and Wyatt 4. Um, reading comprehension um, on both of these um, versions of the test. And then oral reading fluency also is on Wyatt 4. When you look at the, the subtests 3, 4, and 5 under Wyatt 3, you'll notice that the early reading skills subtest is not on Wyatt 4, and I'll talk about that here in a minute. And then down at the bottom for your fluency components, you'll notice that we added two new subtests, orthographic fluency and decoding fluency. So we now have three measures of reading fluency on Wyatt 4 compared to the oral reading fluency subtest on Wyatt 3. Now, a little bit more about early reading skills. Why did we drop early reading skills? Well, we did and we didn't. We no longer have a subtest that is named early reading skills, but if you think back to what early reading skills measures on Wyatt 3, early reading skills measures these four broad areas, right? Categories of items. So phonological awareness, all of those items are captured now by phonemic proficiency. And naming letters and all of the items that assess naming letters and letter sound correspondence are now at the front end of our word reading subtest. So the first 35 items on word reading are these items from early reading skills. And then I think there were five or six items on early reading skills that assess word reading comprehension. The one I always remember is where we had the word on at the bottom and there was a box, there were three boxes and a, a ball was on the box, on one of the boxes, the ball was in the box. So those items are now at the beginning of our reading comprehension subtest. So effectively, you will be able to describe early reading or reading that precedes the reading of words, reading at the subword level, if you will, and the understanding of individual words with the word reading comprehension items. All of those items are incorporated in these subtests. For math, the subtests are the same. You'll recognize math problem solving, numerical operations, and math fluency. And then for writing, spelling, sentence composition, and essay composition are consistent from the three to the four. There are changes in terms of the actual content, which we'll describe in future webinars. 
And then in terms of fluency, the alphabet writing fluency um, subtest is also on Wyatt 4. And we also added a new fluency subtest, sentence writing fluency. So when you think about the five subtests that are new, certainly phonemic proficiency and orthographic choice, and then three of the five subtests assess fluency. Um, and four of the five actually assess um, reading, reading at the subword level, reading um, fluency. So the, what we're trying to do on Wyatt 4, and you'll tell us once you get a chance to take a look at the test, whether or not we've succeeded, we're trying to enhance the assessment of reading. We understand the importance of reading, not just for being able to read, but for being able to learn, right? So, so the assessment of reading, we believe, is enhanced. Um, when you think about the, the nation's report card, the national assessment of educational progress, um, time after time we see the large percentage of students who continue to struggle with reading. And also the reason that we um, wanted to enhance the fluency component is because fluency is such a good predictor of whatever that higher order task is, whether you think about reading comprehension, math problem solving, or written expression. So if you look at the different subtests, and I have 19 of the subtests pictured here, you know the one that's missing, the orthographic choice that's on Q Interactive only, you'll notice that the number of subtests that you administer depends on the grade placement. So a child in pre-kindergarten, for example, you'd administer six subtests, and you could see what they are right here, right? Well, maybe not that well, because this is a, um, a small graphic. But let me just tell you what those are. We assess language for sure. So if you look at um, number three, listening comprehension, number nine, oral expression, we also assess reading, phonemic proficiency, number one, and then number two, word reading, number four, alphabet writing fluency, and then for math, we assess math problem solving subtest six. Even if you can't read the titles of these subtests, you could just look at these dots over to the right, and you could see if a child is in the third or fourth grade, you would administer all 19 subtests. If a child is in 10th grade, um, fifth through 12th grade and beyond, you notice you administer 18 of the subtests. The one you don't administer is alphabet writing fluency. So again, the number of subtests that you administer will depend on the grade placement. So let me just take a closer look at these new subtests and think in terms of what they measure. So phonemic proficiency and orthographic choice, one that focuses on the, the oral language component and then the orthographic choice that focuses on the visual rep representation of words. So for phonemic proficiency, we want to see if the, the the child, and I'm going to refer to this as a child, it's typically a younger child, you want to see if the child is able to manipulate sounds in words, not only accurately, but more importantly, quickly, right? Because it's really important for us to be able to manipulate phonemes really quickly. That will allow me to say the word slowly, segment, and then say it quickly, right? Say, in, in schools, we often say, say it slow, now say it fast. So am I able to manipulate these phonemes quickly so I could segment and then blend? And then orth orthographic choice measures um, recognition spelling skills. Now I'll show you some examples of how we assess those. Three of the new subtests, as I mentioned, measure fluency. Orthographic fluency and decoding fluency have to do with reading, and the difference is in the type of words that we ask the examinee to read fluently. Orthographic fluency, irregular words, words that typically you can't decipher by segmenting and blending or breaking them into component syllables. Like one word that um, I remember when I was growing up, I had a conversation with my mother about um, somebody who had passed away from a cerebral hemorrhage, and then I read the word in a book, and of course, you know, I know so much more than my mother, right? So I'm like, oh, you told me the wrong word. He, it was a, he was him or hagging. It wasn't hemorrhage. So again, words that don't sound the way they look, um, you really have to know the word in order to be able to say it correctly. 
decoding fluency, um, you're thinking about non-words and words that have highly predictable patterns. And then the third fluency subtest is sentence writing fluency. How quickly can you come up with an idea based on a prompt to write a, 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 a grammatically correct sentence? So phonemic proficiency has four different sections, but three different types of tasks. Um, one is elision, where we ask the examinee to omit either syllables or initial sounds or a sound in the final position of the word or in the medial position. So, for example, I might say to the child, say classroom, and now say classroom again, but don't say class. The initial sound, you might give an example like, um, say cat, um, now say cat, but don't say c and then the child would say at. And these words are going to be presented via audio recording, and the student is going to um, respond verbally. And then substitution, maybe I might say a word like, say prize. Now say prize, but change the p to t. So instead of prize, you say tries. And then reversal, say spill, and now say it backward. If you, if you look over to the right where I pulled out the little scoring section to, see, to show you, you could see that we're going to be scoring based on accuracy and speed. You're going to give full credit, which is going to be two points, for a correct response provided within two seconds. You'll give one point for a correct response that is provided beyond two seconds or after two seconds. So effectively, when you look at the scores, you'll be able to make some decisions about accuracy and speed. And what I think will also help you to make decisions about accuracy and speed is your error analysis section. I always like to look at this rightmost column. How many of these items actually were scored one point? That tells you that the, the child is giving you an accurate response, but not within the expected time limit. And that can help us understand the child's needs for intervention. Do we need to intervene at the level of accuracy, at the level of fluency, and so on? The orthographic choice um, component looks at the visual representation of words. It's really a measure of recognition spelling. And it goes to the orthographic representations of words that I have stored in my brain. So we'll ask the examinee to look at three words and effectively to choose the one that looks right. If you look at all three of these words, each one sounds right, but only one of them looks right. Only one of them is the correct orthographic representation of the word welcome. And the thing I want to say about this one is that you will notice that this subtest includes both regular and irregular words, and there is some preference given to words that are commonly misspelled. This is an untimed measure, and if you look at the research related to orthographic choice kinds of measures, there is demonstrated clinical utility for both timed and untimed tasks, and this one is untimed. Orthographic fluency and decoding fluency, um, again, we're asking the student to read words and we want the child to, to read the words quickly. Orthographic fluency will include these irregular words like fuchsia. How, if, I, if I try to break that into its component parts, um, I'm not sure I'd come up with the, the correct pronunciation of the word, like the word Colonel, for example, if I, if I didn't know that word, I might say colonel. So again, these are words that don't lend themselves to phonic decoding. And if you notice, we're going to ask the examinee to read lists of words within 20 seconds or 30 seconds, depending on whether or not you're using 
set A or set B. And effectively, we want to see how many of these words the child is going to name correctly. Decoding fluency in contrast is really an, a measure of phonic decoding proficiency. And the examinee is going to read aloud a list of pseudo words. I think Virginia Berninger talks about these as jabberwocky words, but they're really words with highly predictable patterns. So both of these tasks are really important because if you, if you have a good sight vocabulary, which is represented by orthographic fluency, you'll be able to read quickly, effortlessly. And if on top of a good sight vocabulary, you also can figure out words that are not part of your sight vocabulary, but you know how to attack them. Sometimes we talk about word attack skills. You know how to decode those words. You can read not only fluently, but you can also read independently, right? So both of these are really important because what good orthographic fluency and decoding fluency allow us to do is to, to reserve or limited cognitive resources for complex tasks. I don't need to spend much cognitive energy figuring out what these words are. So I could think about, well, you know, whatever happened to Steve's dog, because as I'm reading these words, I'm really focusing on, on the, the story or the content of the story. Sentence writing fluency, again, there's going to be a time limit on this one. We'll give the um, examinee pictures. Well, each, each item will have a picture and a word, and you would like the examinee to write one sentence using the word under the picture in the sentence without changing the word. So, for example, I might say, pour me some tea. And again, effectively, what I'm looking for here is if you look down at the bottom, that's the section that shows how the scoring will work on this. We're looking for the number of words written, so it assesses ideation fluency. How quickly can you come up with a sentence that uses the word? When you look at the second column, it also assesses lexical knowledge. Did I use the target word unchanged, which would mean that I knew the meaning of the word? And then it also looks at basic grammar, so subject verb agreement. So all of those, for each of those components, you'll have a, a, a component score, which um, you'll add to get the score for the item. So once you administer all of the subtests appropriate for a child of a certain age, you'll be able to combine those subtests to yield different composite scores. So just like on white three, you'll have a composite for reading, one for written expression, one for math, and then some combination of those will yield a total achievement composite. So for example, if you look at reading, you'll notice that for your core academic composite for reading, there are two subtests, word reading and reading comprehension. You will derive a raw score based on the um, examinee's performance, which you will convert to a subtest score. And then over to the right, you could see which of these subtests will contribute to the total achievement composite at each of the grade levels. So for example, for pre-kindergarten, um, you notice that um, word reading um, will contribute to total achievement. You go across, you could see word reading contributes to total achievement um, for all of the grade levels. And then reading comprehension, when you look um, at the second row, you'll notice that starts at kindergarten. I want to say one more thing based on this visual that I have here. When you look at the raw score, typically the raw score, you'll adjust the raw score either by the child's grade placement or the child's age, and that will yield different standard scores. You'll yield a standard score for the subtest. But if you look at reading comprehension, notice that there is a slight in the intermediary step where the reading comprehension raw score is first converted to a weighted raw score, and that weighted raw score is then converted to a standard score for reading comprehension. Now, this is consistent with what we did on Wyatt 3 as well. And of course, the reason for that is because the weighting depends, the, the, 
the meaning of the raw score is dependent on the grade level of the passages that you administered to that child. So we'll talk much more about that when we look at reading in depth. And then written expression, you could see the four subtests that um, load on written expression. But again, when you look at the sub under the subtest box, that second um, column of boxes, you could see that not all of these subtests will be administered to every student in every grade. So for example, the essay, you begin at grade four. The sentence composition subtest, you administer starting at grade two. And then for spelling and alphabet writing fluency starting at um, at kindergarten, kindergarten and grade one. Actually, alphabet writing fluency is also administered at pre-kindergarten. And then for mathematics, um, same concept, and you notice that there are no weighted raw scores there. So you have your four core academic composites, and in addition, you have 10 supplemental composites. And we kind of grouped the supplemental composites. Some of them are related to reading, for example, basic reading and decoding. And I wanted to point out basic reading because the composition of basic reading is different from its composition on Wyatt 3. So basic reading on Wyatt 4 consists of three subtests, phonemic proficiency, pseudo-word decoding, on, and word reading. On Wyatt 3, it consisted of pseudo-word decoding and word reading. We also have a number of academic fluency composites, reading fluency, writing fluency, and math fluency. And I think you know um, the composition of reading fluency, oral reading fluency, and the two new subtests, orthographic and decoding fluency. Decoding fluency. And then there are a number of um, supplemental composites that fall under language processing, oral language consistent with what we had, listening comprehension and oral expression, and then phonological and orthographic processing are new. And over to the right, you could see phonological processing includes phonemic proficiency, pseudo-word decoding, orthographic processing includes orthographic fluency and spelling. Now, the ninth supplemental composite here, orthographic processing extended, that's a new composite as well. And that is the composite that you'll be able to derive if you administer the orthographic choice subtest. So, so the orthographic choice subtest really is going to depend on Q Interactive. You'll be able to derive an orthographic processing composite, but not the extended composite if you don't have the information for orthographic choice. And then the last one, the tenth one, is um, the dyslexia screening indices. And I mentioned that these are now included. And these indices for pre-kindergarten up through third grade, um, that one is derived from two subtests, phonemic proficiency and word reading. And then starting in grade four, you have three subtests, word reading, pseudo-word decoding, and orthographic fluency. And this information will allow you to identify the student's risk for dyslexia um, and will allow you to determine if the student should be referred for a comprehensive evaluation conceivably or possibly a more intensive intervention approach. Just wanted to point out of our supplemental subtests, um, I have them listed here. But the reason I wanted to show you this graphic is I talked earlier about reading comprehension and the fact that reading comprehension, the raw score, is first converted to a weighted raw score. And I wanted you to see that there are two additional subtests, one of which um, had the, the same approach on Wyatt 3, the oral reading fluency subtest, and then the new subtest, orthographic fluency, that for both of those subtests, the raw score is first converted to a weighted raw score, and then the weighted raw score is converted to a standard score. And again, the reason for that is because the raw score needs to be adjusted depending on the grade level of the passages that you use for oral reading fluency and the set, set A or set B, that you use for orthographic fluency. Now, I mentioned that we wanted to enhance the assessment of reading. And certainly, when you think about 
young children, especially kindergarten, first grade, second grade, when they're struggling with basic reading, the way that those difficulties might manifest is really in terms of the way that we define dyslexia or a specific reading disability. Or in the school system, we often talk about a specific learning disability in basic reading. And so you might find that the student is struggling with word recognition um, at the level of fluency and possibly also at the level of accuracy. So both accurate and fluent word recognition is a relative weakness. Child also struggles with decoding, the ability to name words with highly predictable patterns by segmenting and blending, and then also struggles with spelling. And that typical, typically these difficulties result from a deficit in the phonological component of language. So again, we're hoping that the, the addition of some of these new subtests, phonemic proficiency, for example, orthographic, orthographic um, fluency will really help us as we're thinking about students who might struggle with basic reading. So the subtests that we hope are going to be useful certainly are, the, are many of the ones that were retained, word reading, pseudo word decoding, reading comprehension. Reading comprehension, if you're familiar with why it's three, really has an interesting approach to its administration, which allows us to tease out the underlying cause for any reading comprehension difficulties. So we'll talk more about that when we go in depth in terms of reading. But also also, you want to think about fluency. Is fluency an issue? Is it, is it that the, the, the student is struggling at the subword level? So phonemic proficiency, for example, and is the child also struggling with vocabulary? So again, a number of subtests will help us to hone in on why the child might be struggling to achieve grade level objectives in reading. So just to give you a little funny quick test, um, say I'm working with, with a third grade student and I ask him to read this sentence for me, read it um, silently, and then give me some words to complete the sentence. So the student takes a second and he reads it and he says, make lemonade, right? And so I write that down and then I ask him to read it out loud for me. And he says, if life gives you lemons, make lemonade. And I say, thanks so much for reading with me. I really enjoyed our time together. And I think, right, I'm thinking if life gives you lemons in this situation, you may be dyslexic. So when you think about the Wyatt 4, one of the things that we're hoping that the Wyatt 4 will allow us to do is not only identify students who might be struggling with basic reading, with accurate and fluent word recognition, and with decoding, but also help us to identify different subtypes of reading disability. So in this example here, this um, funny quick test, I may be thinking um, hypothetically, is this a student who struggles with phonological dyslexia? Because the student seems to be unable to use a phonological route to figure out this word, and therefore the student tends to over rely on the visual or the orthographic clues, right? So that is one subtype of a specific reading disability. And I, I'm not sure that is the case, but certainly based on his response to this, I may um, generate a hypothesis, right? So hopefully you'll be able to see how the components will allow us to identify not only a, a specific reading disability, but also maybe um, the, the subtype of reading disability. Okay. So we talked a lot about reading, and we want to go to a different part of written language now, and that's going to be the essay and the sentences. So for the essay composition, um, for Wyatt 3, you know the essay composition, we gave the student um, a prompt, write about your favorite game, include at least three reasons why you like it. We're going to use that, we're using that same prompt for Wyatt 4, 
But the score, the change to the essay for Wyatt Four is really in the scoring. So you have two options for scoring. Um, one is the automated scoring, which you could use either through Q Global or through Q Interactive, or you have the hand scoring which you could use um, using the record form and the manual. So when you look at the essay composition, the automated scoring will ask the examinee to handwrite the essay, and then you, the examiner, will transcribe the essay verbatim and then submit it for scoring. So you need to have internet access, and you'll use either the Q Global platform or the Q Interactive platform, and then the intelligent essay assessor will score the essay and return the results. And the way it works is as soon as you enter the essay and you submit, um, the program will think for a second, and then it will generate a score, and you'll be able to see that. If you're scoring by hand, the way that you'll do that is you'll read through the essay and you will identify correct word sequences and incorrect word sequences. And the total raw score for the essay is going to be the difference between correct word sequences and incorrect word sequences. And you may recognize this, right? Because this is effectively the Grammar and Mechanics Supplemental Score from Wyatt 3, where we looked at correct word sequences, incorrect word sequences, and then the total raw score, correct and incorrect word sequences, was the difference between um, those two. So this should be familiar to you. And when you think about about um, correct and incorrect word sequences, you're focusing on grammar, you're focusing on mechanics. So effectively, one of the things you may want to do once you have your score is to look at the types of errors um, that would have contributed to that score. And if you look at the different categories of these errors, you'll see they fall into grammar and mechanics. So, so mechanics, capitalization, end punctuation, internal punctuation, um, grammar, you're thinking about, um, about verb usage, pronoun usage, word order. Another component of mechanics would be the spelling in addition to this qualitative analysis by looking at the types of errors, you'll also be able to conduct qualitative analysis by looking at the content and the organization of the essay. So does the essay include an introduction? Does the essay include a body, a conclusion, and so on? And did did the writer, in fact, give me three reasons? So in the body, is there a reason one, a reason two, and a reason three? So you're collecting qualitative information now um, based on content and organization, and the quantitative information is going to be based on correct word sequences minus incorrect word sequences. So what is the essay measuring? It's measuring grammar and syntax, written mechanics, it's also measuring spontaneous writing. The student is going to be given 10 minutes, so we want to see what you can come up with within that 10-minute period. Unlike the essay on Wyatt 3, it's not designed to measure cohesion, creativity, text organization, sense of audience, although, as I indicated, you are able to generate qualitative information on those um, components. Now, sentence building and sentence combining, the sentence composition subtest includes those two different types of tasks. The first one here, the sentence building, I'm going to present the student with a word, and I'd like the student to use the target word within a complete sentence. So when you look at the prerequisites, did the student write a complete sentence? Did the student use the target word? Then we will use the, the sentence that meets our prerequisite criteria. We'll evaluate it for content. We'll look at semantics and grammar. We'll also evaluate mechanics, capitalization, and punctuation, and internal punctuation. You'll notice for each of our two components of content, or three for mechanics, the scoring for each item is going to be one at compared to zero, one, zero or one here, compared to zero, one, or two on the Wyatt 3. So the scoring is simplified. 
Similarly, for sentence combining, where you'll provide the student with either two or three sentences, and you'd like the student to combine those sentences to write one complete sentence that includes the essential information from the original sentences. And then again, we'll evaluate each sentence that meets our prerequisite criteria for content and for mechanics. And we'll be talking in more detail about the scoring of these, um, of both the essay, if you're going to be scoring using the paper, um, the paper components, as well as the scoring criteria for our sentence composition subtest. Okay, so you've done all this, you've administered the subtest, you've derived different composite scores, um, and now you want to use your data to make some decisions um, with respect to the child's um, eligibility and need, possibly for direct specialized instruction. The subtest and composites on the Wyatt 4 will allow you to make decisions with respect to the eight disability areas identified by by the Individuals with Disabilities Education Improvement Act. Um, those eight SLD areas, you're thinking about the three reading areas, basic reading, reading comprehension, oral reading fluency, um, written expression, the two areas for math, and then the, um, the two for language, listening comprehension and oral expression. Also, the data will provide what you need if you're making decisions, diagnostic decisions, using the DSM-5. And the Wyatt 4 also provides the information for most of the 10 key skill areas recommended by the International Dyslexia Association for Dyslexia Evaluation. There are a few, and you've already noticed what those are, I'm sure. Certainly one of those 10 areas is rapid naming. If you are administering um, an, an intelligence test, for example, the WISC-5, certainly you'll have information on rapid naming. Another component is is auditory working memory, which again, um, a measure like WISC-5 would provide that kind of information. If you're making decisions um, with if you're making eligibility decisions using ability achievement discrepancy analysis, we are providing information in the technical manual um, connecting um, the Wyatt 4 with several different measures of ability, the WIPC4, the WISC5, and the KBC2 new. And effectively, what you'll be doing is um, looking at the ability standard score. What's my full-scale IQ, for example, using that ability standard score to predict my achievement scores on the Wyatt, and then calculating the difference, but, and then also identifying, sorry, the actual achievement score, calculating the difference between the predicted and the actual score, determining whether those differences are significant and whether or not those differences are unusual um, based on the base rate or the frequency of occurrence. Now, there are so many measures of intelligence that we use um, when we are when we are evaluating for possible specific learning disability classification. And if the the ability measure that you use um, is does not appear here. Certainly, you can still compare your ability standard score with your achievement score scores. In that case, you'll do what I did um, when I worked in one school district where they used a simple difference method. So any achievement score that was 15 points or more below the ability score, we'd say that the child is underachieving relative to his or her ability to learn. And then I wanted to say a few words about connecting assessment to intervention because ultimately we conduct assessments because we want to know what to do to help the child to succeed. And the error analysis components on Wyatt 4 we believe will be really helpful for that. A number of subtests will provide error analysis worksheets like word reading, pseudo word decoding. Some of the subtests include error analysis inside the record form, for example, the essay composition, the sentence composition, the reading composition, which I have pictured here. You could see for reading comprehension, some of the, past, some of the items assess literal comprehension, 
some assess inferential comprehension, some of the passages are narrative, some are expository. So am I struggling primarily with items that assess inferential comprehension, for example, so you'll be able to um, tease those out. Now, the error analysis will actually connect to intervention goal statements if you're using Q Global or Q Interactive. And the way that those intervention goal statements will present is similar to the way they, were pre they are presented on Wyatt 3. So we'll use the items with errors, figure out if the items with errors fall into a specific category, like let's say single consonants, and then based on the child's errors, we write an annual goal. So given a list of, let's say, 20 words containing um, initial position single consonants, the student will read the list aloud with no more than two single consonant errors, for example. So again, you'll be able to produce this generic information, and then the teacher will be able to write in um, what the criterion level of performance would be. And for each of the annual goals, you have a number of short-term objectives. Um, how are you going to do that? Are you going to use some of this information in the individualized education plan? And then you want to think about whether or not you can use the information on Wyatt 4 to monitor progress. And I reference the growth scale values. Um, is, the, is the student making progress relative to, um, to his own past performance? Is the rate of improvement faster or slower um, than that of his or her peers? And to answer those questions, you really always look at two things. And we, we will have a, a section, a chapter in the manual that will focus on interpretation of growth scale values. But effectively, you want to look at the magnitude of the difference between the growth scale values at time two and time one. In this case, there's a 16-point difference. And that tells us whether or not the student learned new math skills and that the 16-point difference tells us that the student did. The standard score of 88 that remained consistent tells you about the rate of improvement. If the standard score remains consistent, it tells you that this student's rate of improvement was consistent with that of his or her peers. And that may be a good thing, but depending on how far behind the child is, we may, we may prefer for the child to actually improve at a faster rate than his or her peers. Okay, so a few words about our normative sample, and we'll certainly provide more details about the normative sample as well as the technical properties of the Wyatt 4 as we um, get closer to publication. For now, we want to let you know that um, in terms of the normative sample, um, the sample consisted of um, individuals representative of the U.S. English-speaking population of students in grades pre-kindergarten through 12, and also individuals between the ages of four years, zero months, and 50 years, 11 months. So the sample, um, as our, most of our samples, are stratified by a number of variables, including grade, age, um, parent or self-education level, and um, the stratification um, was based on the 2018 U data from the 2018 U.S. Bureau of the Census. One of the questions that we often get asked is, when you look at the grade-based norm sample, um, an N of 2,100 individuals in grades pre-kindergarten through grade 12, often um, we might get asked the question, well, why did we not have data for college-age students? And that is because college-age students tend to be captured in our age-based norm sample, where the ages go from four years up through 50 years. So just to review what we said, we hoped you would take away the changes from the Wyatt 3 to the Wyatt 4. We talked about 20 subtests on Wyatt 4, 16 subtests on Wyatt 3. Um, in terms of the subtests and composites, we talked about the five new subtests, um, three fluency subtests, phonemic proficiency and orthographic choice, um, also new composites, the reading fluency, writing fluency, the orthographic processing, for example, 
and then how you use wide four results to determine eligibility. Certainly, I mentioned ability achievement discrepancy analysis, but in the manual, and we'll talk more about this, we'll also um, talk about different methods to determine eligibility eligibility. Maybe you're using cognitive hypothesis testing or pattern of strengths and weaknesses analysis, right? So there are different approaches um, certainly that are useful. And then I mentioned the intervention goal statements that would be derived based on error analysis. Um, certainly that is an option as well. So as we conclude, um, I want to just um, tell you that we are going to be working on a number of different webinars as we move forward. So be on the lookout for future um, webinars. Certainly the Wyatt 4 Subtest Administration will talk more about the administration guidelines. The clinical utility of the Wyatt 4 um, will really want to talk more about how the Wyatt 4 will answer two different types of questions for us. What, what are the child's strengths, what are the child's needs, but also why, why is the child underachieving in a certain area. We want to focus on the written expression subtests, especially focusing on the scoring, and we also want to think about any other topics that might be of interest to you. So as you're exiting, if you would share any ideas in the chat box, that would be helpful. And then, of course, as I mentioned, our goal was to enhance the Wyatt 4 around the assessment of reading. And so we definitely want to make sure that we spend some time talking about how the Wyatt 4 can help us to understand why Joni or Susie or Mark or whoever, why, why young children um, may still be struggling um, to learn to read. And so um, as I think about why Joni can't read, and you might recognize that as a play on why Johnny can't read, right? That was published, um, I think, around 1955 by Rudolf Flesch, and then um, several years later, around 1981, why Johnny still can't read. And I want to just end up here by giving you um, a little trivia piece of knowledge that you can hang on to your tree of knowledge and you can pull it out when you go to your next trivia night party. So remember how I was talking about reading comprehension and how the raw score is converted to a weighted raw score? Same thing for oral reading fluency. And of course, what is important there is you're thinking about the readability of the passages, right? Like what is the grade level for which certain passages would be appropriate on the reading comprehension subtest? Well, did you know, and I didn't know this until I was doing some research for this webinar, that one of the methods that we use to establish the readability of passages is the Flesch-Kincaid method, right? Well, did you know that the flesh in Flesh Kincaid is the same Rudolf Flesh who wrote the books Why Johnny Can't Read and Why Johnny Still Can't Read? Yes, you're welcome. Okay, so I think um, we want to talk more about the what and the why in future webinars. We want to talk about using a child's performance and unpacking the child's performance to figure out why the child is struggling, for example, with reading comprehension. Is it because of language comprehension? Well, let me compare scores on reading comprehension and listening comprehension. Or is it because of vocabulary? Well, let me take a look at receptive vocabulary, expressive vocabulary. Or might it be because of word recognition? sight vocabulary, word reading, or phonic decoding, pseudo-word decoding. So again, when you look at the makeup of the Wyatt 4, how can the child's performance on different subtests allow us not only to identify um, that the child's performance is below grade level, but may help us to understand why. So a child who, for example, would say, oh, I'm ready for my dessert because I already had my entry, this is not the child who called the melons lemons, right? This is a different child who clearly does have good phonological decoding skills, but 
even if she has heard this word in conversation, she did not make the connection between the entree and the entree, which she is clearly seeing on the page. So again, think about how the data can really help us to understand what the child is experiencing in terms of academic content areas, but also why the child might be struggling. Certainly our website will include this on the handout for you. You could take a look at our website, the different options that are available for you. We get questions about telepractice all the time. We do have information on our website about telepractice. We'll include this in our handout for you as well. If you have questions, please do contact your assessment consultant. And I think that brings us to the end of our webinar. And we're glad that you were able to join us. And please do contact us if you have questions. Thanks to my colleagues for helping me with the chat box. And I wish everybody a wonderful rest of your day. Thank you again for joining us today for this introduction to the Wyatt webinar. I hope you found the information useful. Um, again, my contact details are there on the screen. If you have any questions about the Wyatt or any other of our assessments, please feel free to contact me by email or phone. Um, and I hope everybody has a great day. Thank you. Bye-bye.